So what's, what's going on here? What? Big clue. <laughs> this is the British Grand Prix. And it's the venue of the first ever Formula One Grand Prix in 1950, which is way older than New Ori. This has been going for 75 years. It's cool, right? And so here we are to find out what it takes to put on a Formula One race in terms of the engineering, the innovation, and explore places that people rarely get to see. We're going in Scuderia Ferrari's garage. Ferrari. Ferrari. The car. Them. The red fast car. That's them in the pit lane, in the garage. We're gonna be talking to an engineer. We got our friends Bit Defender, who are one of the key partners with Ferrari. Bit Defender, they, they're at like a security, cyber security. Good, well, good knowledge. Well, I knew that. They are, but they're also gonna help us explore the innovation and engineering. For me, Formula One is the pinnacle of innovation and engineering. Okay, I'm an astrophysicist. That would be landing on Mars with an SUV-sized rover. Or humans walking on the moon. Anyone else see that one coming? <laughs> Tell you what, you're gonna fall in love. Okay. With the red beauty that's down okay. there. I'll put it Let's number see. two, but I ain't going to number one. And we'll see after you've been down there. The Silverstone track is a former airfield. The straights are long, mm. so you really can floor it and go for it. But they've also built in a number of long, I call them luxurious, luscious bends, and you can you get that speed. But as we found out, they're pulling stupid amounts of G. Normally when we think of G-forces, we yeah. think of something that's pressing down on you, straight the length of your spine. Mm. So two things will affect the g-forces in the turn one of them mm. is how fast you're going into the turn the second is how tight the turn is huh? both of those combined can increase the tighter the turn the faster you're going will increase the g-forces sideways and these guys are hitting three four five g so five g sideways you know your heart is just kind of dangling there in your chest oh don't head, do that your head is like bobbing on your on your neck. Which is why you see the drivers, they've got this kind of brace around their neck, this contraption that I, I noticed it, them, yeah. In the compartment, they're, they're shoulder to shoulder mm -hmm. with the size of their seating area. Yeah. And yeah, and their head is is restrained, yeah. right? So they can't, the head is not just some- Can you imagine being flopping around like that and you're getting five Gs well, at, slid through the at, side of at you? five Gs, yeah. Your inner organs, they're gonna feel it. <laughs> It's brutal. What can we compare okay. that with? So when NASA launches astronauts, they throttle such that they don't experience more than three Gs. So that's why the, not the solid rocket boosters, mm. which are unthrottleable. Right. Once you light those puppies, that's it, it goes. Done. Yeah. Okay, until they run out, then you separate them. And then the main engine, that's the one that they can throttle. And so that throttles in response to what these G-forces will be. And those are, they're seated as you see, you know yeah. how they get into the face grip. So that one's actually against their chest because they're seated backwards. Yep. But keep in mind that's sustained for the entire yeah. launch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that can go up to several minutes, maybe even up to eight minutes. What actually blew me away, not the fact that when you get close up to one of the cars, just how bloody big it is, but because they're modular, you can just pop parts of the car off. They're putting the nose on right now. And the most modular part are the tires. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right? They're, don't blink. You watch their four tires, you, you turn your head this way, you turn your head back and it's four new tires on the car. I, I timed them, it was yeah. like 2.1 seconds yeah. or something. And they, they'll get it sub two. So Gary, let's yeah. see what Federico had to say on that very subject. This is also a track dependent discussion. Because uh, imagine uh, in, in Italy we have Monza. Monza sure. is a track in which uh, you reach very high speed. And for that, uh, you need a car that has less drag as possible. So you have to shape this for the track, for the needs of the, of the race. You, Every you, track, you tune uh, it. Yeah. we can tune yes. the aero surfaces, we can tune the setup, yeah. we can tune uh, many things. One of the big concerns for setting this car up 
to Silverstone oh, as opposed it. now to Monaco, where there's lots of tight curves, no straights, no lovely luscious bends. Yeah, Silverstone is a, a temple in terms of a high speed corner. Uh -huh. These kind of cars, when you are moving full throttle through these corners, if you go up to 4G of lateral acceleration, you need to have load on the tires. Yes, to, to grip the road. Otherwise, yeah, you, you will you fly need grip, off. Otherwise, you would fly. So you need maximum friction yeah. between your tires and the road. You so need to put as much load as you can on the tires uh, such that uh, you maximize the grip. This is my first Formula One race ever. It was raining. Oh, that was, well, that's British. Summer. I did not know, sorry. It was raining at 50 degrees. It's cold and wet and it's July. So I was surprised, I was just ignorant of this, mm. that you could race in the rain. You see what they did with not increasing the mass of the car, but increasing the weight on the car with the downforce? The force. Yeah. The force. Because uh -huh. when it's wet, it's slippy, as we've discussed already. And you need higher downward. Yeah. Force. And mm -hmm. how they go about achieving this. So the aerodynamics going over the car, there's the car shape itself, which yeah. surely they've thought about. But then they got these add-ons, right? There, there's, a, there's an airfoil. Basically creates extra air pressure down on the rear wheels, which is where your traction is coming from, not the front wheel. No. The structure of the airfoil at, as an add-on to the chassis mm. enables the air to create a higher downward force, which increases the friction between the tires and the road, which then gives you more traction because your traction is 100% determined by that friction. Now, have you ever seen, if you sit over the wing in an airplane flight, yeah, and you watch it when it takes off and when it lands, the wing gets bigger. Yeah. There's a piece of the wing that- It that extends out. It extends out and yeah. curves down. Mm -hmm. So the more wing surface they have, the more lift. And since it curves down, yeah. there's pressure air pressure on it to lift it up. Yeah. Now take that whole thing and flip it. And now what they had on the on the Formula One was there's a curved surface that comes up. That's that extra lift the plane is getting by pointing down. Now you want extra pressure coming down from the speed going forward. And that's what's on the back of the Formula One. You were down on the ground because mm -hmm. you couldn't believe just how close. Right. Very very low center of mass, very stable on turns, on everything, like three fingers. Then the airspeed mm -hmm. is gonna be very high across the ground. The car is dragging air with it. Yeah. Okay. It's the unseen. Okay, it's, it's dragging it, yeah. air with it. So that will create a partial pressure upwards because moving air has lower pressure than yeah. stationary air. And what did I hear? At one of the races, a car drove so fast down the street, it sucked up one of the drain covers and hit the bottom of the chassis. In Vegas, they hadn't sealed it properly to make sure it stayed where it was put. Okay, because un underneath the drain is regular air pressure. Yep. And fast moving air is lower air pressure. That's very Bernoulli. And so if you have a, a difference in pressure, watch out. We were looking at Carlos Sainz's car, Ferrari, and it was he who had one of these drain covers oh, pop as he okay. drove over it. So anything hitting anything moving 180 miles an hour is bad. Yeah, totally not good. And I'm sure the garage were very unhappy. Right. But the garage was fun. All the Ferrari mechanics start to do exercises. Oh no, that was fun. Oh, yeah, that was a little weird. <laughs> they did a warm up. I, could, it's, it's, I it's was the not expecting. Day, and they all like, they all, they did calisthenics. They, they, they started doing calisthenics. They did jumping yeah. jacks. Yes. They had a, like a rubber hose mm -hmm. that they were stretching. Yeah. They were pressing on their neck. And I thought I'd join in with them. <laughs> and I got a cut, you know, some of the stretching yeah, and you things. Were there. You were there. I... And, and they did like lunges. I know. And at first I was wondering, like, what are they doing? They're just like killing time. They have to be nimble and ready when the car comes in for the pit stop so that the pit stop doesn't last more than two and a half seconds. All four wheels are on, secured, and the car's out in under three seconds, two and a half seconds. It's impressive. Right. To say that. Of course, they least. lose more time than that mm. because they have to slow down yeah. to go into the lane. There's like 50 mile an hour speed limit. Yeah, you can't. I mean, uh, can you imagine coming in at 100 miles an hour? You'd be like, <laughs> it'd be like 10 pin bowling. You'd right. skittle people <laughs> everywhere. People to 10 pin bowling. And then I think back to the sort of fan zone area we ended up in. Well, the fan zone, right, because they also had the simulated uh, driving yeah. experience. 
Am I supposed to go on the grass? Is that allowed? <laughs> As I remember, Formula One pledged to go carbon neutral yes. by 2030. I'm told they're on track to beat that date. And they're going synthetic. No. Partly? Not synthetic. So here's what they're doing. They're taking, after we after my long conversation mm. with the person in the booth, Yeah. what she said was they're going to take water, mm. and with solar energy, they're going to dissociate the molecule, which is the chemist word Ooh. for separating... Hydrogen from... Separating hydrogen from... from oxygen. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> knew you had it in your... So, and so now you have the hydrogen. Now they recapture carbon dioxide from the environment and by their magic ways will combine the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide and turn it into basically gasoline. So in that sense, it's not synthetic fuel. No, no. It's synthetically manufactured real fuel. Okay. And that means they don't have to change their engines. See? They don't have to there are some smart people I around. I know, I know. How's that for innovation? Another thing that intrigued me just as a scientist is to hear Rodrigo mm. just talk about the constraints put on him, the engineer, by the rules and regulations of the sport. We need to think outside the box. Imagine, for example, me as an aerodynamicist, I play every day within these legality boxes. Regulations change every few years, mm -hmm. such that it's like drawing a zero line, and you restart again. And, and what the public doesn't typically appreciate yeah. is that engineers love constraints. Well, see, if you say, here, do it with, with anything you need, they don't, they're lost. Yeah. So you say, <laughs> do it for this amount of weight with that price at this thing. Because yeah. if you give us uh, constraints, uh, we always target ourselves uh, to lie exactly on the limits. You're not on the so limit, yeah. If you're in complete control of your car, you're not in the race at all. Maybe that's a bit of a, an exaggeration, of course, but the, but the idea is something to reckon. Mm. Because you want to take the car to its limits. Taking it beyond what is perceived to be its limit. If track and field athletes that's didn't have that mentality, we'd never get a record broken. Oh, that's right. You would never run faster than you've ever run before. Mm. A fascinating thing about the Silverstone track, you are at full throttle, 60% of the race. As we found out, probably the fastest thing at the track is something you can't actually see, which would be all the data transfer. Communications is one thing, but then Ferrari has to look at many other things. Intellectual property theft, mm -hmm. uh, they, their design has to be safe and secure, so what they store their data is a very, uh, very important place. Uh, if you know the concept of uh, supply chain attacks or supply chain security, that's also very important because if you have a nice car that has like, it's not like a plane with a million or a billion pieces, but I think there's a couple of hundred thousands in there. And if one of them is faulty or hacked and it's digital, that can also correct, uh, can, uh, create issues. If someone gets into the supply chain and gives you a faulty bolt that will crumble on the third turn. It can actually be lethal. I hadn't thought about that. Okay, because so, so therefore, not all the world is bits and bytes. <laughs> with the sponsorship, obviously, with Ferrari, and we can see it, it's visible, but what? cybersecurity services do you provide? Is it just to Ferrari or is it to F1 as a whole outfit? Uh, when it comes to Ferrari, they use our threat intelligence feeds. Uh, so basically they consume all the data that we have related to cyber crimes and to cyber attacks. We send them uh, various um, indicators of compromise. Basically, if you see that indicator of compromise somewhere within your organization, it means that you have been already compromised. So we send this to them. They can secure not only themselves, but also the uh, their partners and their other people they're working with. This is, this is what we do with Ferrari right now. While we were in the Ferrari garage at the Formula One race in, in Silverstone, uh, I noticed uh, Bitdefender your logo was on the what they call the halo. The halo. The halo, which is kind of their modern version of a roll bar, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely protecting their head. <laughs> yeah. In a, in a very blunt way. But what attracted you to Ferrari in the first place? We believe, uh, as we actually started the discussion, that the engineering to build a race car and to drive a race car and the amount of speeds that they're driving, it's all about, you know, decision-making, 
the ingenuity, the innovation, and so on. And these are similar values to what we have in Bit Defender. We believe a lot of innovation, but also things that I do in my team with the cyber investigations, where we have to think fast in order to see what if there's a crime being committed and so on. So it was a, rather a decision of similar values. And that's why we decided on the halo, because that's referring to actual protection and exactly what we do as well. We see what Alex is saying there, that there is this resonance between what he does in his everyday life in cybersecurity and how Ferrari go about being a, a leader within Formula One racing. Alex, thank you so much. You've been superb with us. Now, Gary, I got to level with you. I'm born and raised in New York City. Uh -huh. We don't have relationships with cars. It's a very late in life thing. Yeah, I, I, I didn't I've learn come how to, to learn that until yeah. I was 25. You know, I have some fluency now because mm -hmm. I'm intrigued that it is a thing. Yeah, but it was never sort of native to my to my to my core being. But to see all the engineering, which boosts my interest in it. Yeah, it's not just four wheels. It's mm -hmm. like the the aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering, the material science yes. that goes into it. Uh, it's a science project.